Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, the scripture text is taken from Luke chapter 15. It's verses 1 through 3, and then I'll be reading verses 11 through 32. And this is what it says. Now all the tax gatherers and sinners were coming near him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And he told them this parable. And now going over to verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. And he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me as one of your hired men. And he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to be merry. And his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I've never neglected a command of yours. Yet you have never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came, you and who has devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, My child, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to be merry and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Pray with me. Jesus, this day it's your day and we get to be a part of it. May the gratitude not stop, but may worship be one thing where you, you give us those eyes and those ears that see your kingdom coming in all around us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today is March 27th. 
I think most folks might have known that. What you might not have known is that it's National Joe Day. Yes. And on the national calendar of holidays, National Joe Day is a day where we're invited to celebrate by enjoying a cup of Joe with a friend named Joe. It's National Joe Day. Now that Joe might be a, a, a Joseph or a Josephine or a Joanna, but anybody with a variation of a name named Joe. <clears throat> You're invited to enjoy a cup of Joe with a friend named Joe. Yes, I'm full of information like that, but it's information that has a point this morning. I think we all enjoy being invited, invited to to enjoy. And, and throughout the scripture here, that word joy, whether it's enjoy or rejoice, it's said again and again and again and again. And I don't think I've ever noticed it as much before. Because it's a scripture text that it's a story that even folks who've never been into a church before, we've heard this story before. We know this story. But actually it's three stories back to back to back that Jesus is telling. And the, the key word in each of these stories is joy. Enjoy. Rejoice. It's an invitation. It's an invitation. And we begin to see it, especially when we read these first three verses that I read to you this morning. That we, we have the, the joy, the enjoy, the rejoice that's in contrast to grumble. It says both the Pharisees and the scribes begin to grumble. We've got grumbling contrasting with the joy. Well, what are the scribes and the Pharisees, what are they grumbling about? What do they have to grumble about? I mean, they're on the top of the heap. Everything's going their way. Sure seems like it that anyway, if, if, if anybody had it well off in, in ancient Israel, I think the scribes and Pharisees, it, they were honored people. The scribes especially were very wealthy people as well. Seems like they had the best of everything, but still they're grumbling. Well, they're grumbling because in their heart they had two lists. They had an A list and a B list. And the A list, well, that was the, the, the folks that believed like them, behaved like them, and belonged like they did. But there was a B list. In their hearts they had a B list, and these were the folks that did not behave like them, did not belong with them and they did not believe like them and Jesus was hanging out with b-listers they had a clear idea of us and them and Jesus was hanging out with them oh and it created all kinds of grumbling some of your bibles may have said murmuring but if it was anything it was not joy and they were certain they were certain that that these two lists in their heart that God had a heart just like they did. And that God had a heart of us and them. And God divided the world the same way that they divided the world. They had already divided sheep and goats. And they were pretty sure that God was, was following along with, with their lists. And so they grumbled. And so Jesus tells them a story. The first story that Jesus tells them is a story about the heart of God. And it's a story about a a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. Well, we've heard this story before. One of them goes missing. Now, an important thing to notice is, is that this sheep doesn't turn into a bad sheep. Sheep doesn't grow fangs and go after all the rest of the, the sheep in the, in, the, in the flock. Doesn't start tearing up sheep and killing sheep. No. And it's not even a sheep with initiative. I, I read a story just a little while back, Associated Press, that there were some shepherds in Turkey watching after sheep. Well, they turned their back on the sheep to go eat breakfast, and they left the sheep alone for just a little too long, and one of the sheep jumped off a cliff, and one after another, before they could get them stopped, 450 sheep were dead by jumping off this cliff. A sheep with initiative is a very dangerous thing. Well, it doesn't say this sheep suddenly got initiative and decided to jump off a, a cliff and the other sheep were following him. It doesn't say anything about him being a bad sheep or a sheep with initiative. That he did what sheep do. He wandered away. 
He had his eyes set on whatever it was that was in front of him. And he went from this piece of grass to that piece of grass to the next piece of grass until he was separated from the flock. Well, a sheep who's separated from a flock is in immediate danger. Predators. Anything that wanted to get a sheep that's separated from the shepherd and from the flock is in immediate danger. So Jesus tells a story about a shepherd who, who left the 99 in the open pasture and went to find the one as if this sheep was the only one. And he found him, put him on his shoulders, brought him back. And when he brought him back, there was rejoicing, there was joy. And, 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 and that's the word that's used right there. And Jesus says there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 who need no repentance. Well, obviously the grumbler, grumblers didn't hear it because they, they, they're thinking, well, he's talking about sheep. He's not talking about us. So Jesus tells another story. Jesus tells a story about a woman who had 10 coins. And it doesn't say that one of the coins sprouted legs and jumped up and ran off the table and hid somewhere in the house. It doesn't say that, that, that the coin turned from silver into lead, that it was no fault of the coin, that the coin just it went missing. It was out of circulation that this coin wasn't able to be used for the purpose that it was intended the purpose for which it was made. That you and I were made with a purpose. You and I were made with a purpose. And when this coin got out of circulation, out of the purpose for which it, it was made, that this woman didn't say, well, you know, nine coins is just about as good as ten. Well, I can get by with nine because, I mean, after all, it's just one and it's, it's a drachma and it's not all that much money. No. Jesus is telling a story not about coins but about the heart of God. And this woman, this woman in the story reflects the heart of God because she brought out light. And she began to sweep. She began to search and she, until she found the one that was missing, the one that was out of circulation. And she calls her friends together to celebrate with her in joy. There's that word again. Six times again and again and again through these verses. That, and Jesus goes on to say that that's the kind of joy that God has with angels in heaven. Over one sinner who repents. Well still, the grumblers are grumbling. He must be telling stories about coins and not about us. So, Jesus tells another story. Now, if a sheep is valuable and a, and a coin is more valuable, a child, there's nothing more valuable than that. There's nothing more valuable than that. And so, Jesus tells the, this story that we read this morning. It's a story we've all heard before. There's some parts of it that, you know, might be news to us. Um, and the first part is that a young man, a man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father. Now, that's not a throwaway line right there. That's an important part. That the younger one said to his father, Dad, you know, I was thinking about when you die. I'll be real sad on that day, but um, I'm also thinking about the inheritance I might get on that day, and I don't want to wait till then. I'll just take the part that falls to me now. Well, this is the younger son. And Deuteronomy 21, 17 prescribes what goes to the younger son, what goes to the older son. That the father didn't just divide it up any way he wanted and certainly didn't divide it up any way that the younger son wanted. That whether the father wanted to or not, there was a prescribed way of dividing the inheritance between the younger and the older. The younger son received a third of the estate. And the older son received two-thirds of the estate. But it was deliberate. He didn't slip up and say, oops, 
I accidentally let it out. I, I wanted the inheritance, if that's okay with you. No, he was deliberate about it. He made a choice. He wasn't like a, a, a sheep that just wandered into the conversation. And he certainly wasn't like a coin where the circumstances led him to this. No, this was deliberate. He was deliberate. He was selfish. He was hurtful. And he was thoughtless. And the surprising thing happens. The father says, okay. Gives him an, a one-third of the estate, the, the part that, as it says, falls to him. Well, he took that third and he says that he went into a distant country and he squandered the estate on loose living. Now, we don't know what loose living is. You may have heard some preachers talk about what loose living is. I remember I heard one preacher preach long and hard that he, he went gambling and chasing women and drinking liquor out of the bottle. Well, that talks a little bit more about what's on the preacher's mind than it does what's here in the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't say all that. Just says he squandered it on loose living. And then a famine came. Well, when the famine came, he had to go to work. And being uh, from out of the country, he only got the worst work that was available. Feeding pigs. And it goes on to say that, that in verse 16, that he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. Now, it doesn't say what those pods were, but I know. It was okra. When you start wanting okra, you've hit rock bottom. Any vegetable that has fur on it, just run away. That, that it's just wrong for vegetables to have fur on them. And he started wanting to eat okra. And then verse 17, it says that he came to his senses. That he was out of the relationship with his father. He was intended to be a son, but now he's living like a slave. He was out of relationship with the family. He was intended to be a brother, but now he was living like a, a slave. That even the servants in his father's house, it says, had enough bread. Actually, the word there is abundant bread. That they didn't just have enough. They had more than enough. They had an abundance of bread, but he's wanting okra. I mean, he's in a bad way. And he says he's dying here. Then when he comes to his senses, he says, I'll go to my father and I'll say, I have, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. That he doesn't deserve to be in the relationship that he had before. That make him as one of the hired people. So he's practicing it. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And verse 20 tells us, And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. The father's eyes were, were, were peeled to the horizon. This may be the most beautiful verse in the whole of the Bible. While he was still a long way off. That the father didn't wait for him to come and to fall at his feet. The father didn't wait for him to, to grovel. That this is a story about the heart of God. That the heart of God is, an, is an, a, 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 a heart of two lists. It's a heart that, well, it says right here. He says, and that he felt compassion for him and ran and embraced and kissed him. That God's heart is a heart that, that, that has his eyes peeled for those who are still a long way off. It's a heart of compassion that, that runs and embraces and kisses. It's a heart. It's a heart where forgiveness precedes repentance. That's difficult for some folks to hear. That's the message of the cross. That forgiveness precedes repentance. Forgiveness precedes repentance. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That Jesus didn't wait till we were better than we had been or as good as we're going to be. It's while we're still a long way off. That, that he feels compassion and runs and embraces, calls for the robe, for the sandal, for the ring for his finger, for restoration, 
of his position as a son, his position as a brother, his position in the, the family and the place to belong. Forgiveness precedes repentance. And God is not reluctant to forgive you and me, even when we're still a long way off. It's that we're reluctant to receive. And that we don't receive that forgiveness until we ask for it. As a matter of fact, our tendency is to grumble. To grumble. To grumble that, that what somebody else has or doesn't have, that they aren't like us, they don't believe, they don't belong, and they don't that behave like us. And that's what we see in the older brother. He had twice as much as his little brother. He received two-thirds of the estate. But still it says that he was angry. That he was angry. In verse 26, he became angry and was not willing to go in. That he couldn't take part in the, the rejoicing, not in the merriment, not in the dancing, not in the joy. Even though he had received twice as much. Even though he had never broken that relationship with the father. He was angry. He was grumbling. He was dividing us and and him, his brother. He was separating sheep from goats. And you know, sometimes, sometimes that's the easiest thing to do rather than repent. To separate sheep from goats. To divide us and them. To point to somebody with a, a worse record. To say, well, at least I'm not like Vladimir Putin. You know, as long as Putin's around, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm not that bad. Maybe it's pointing to a brother or a sister. Maybe it's pointing to someone in a different party or a diff different church. You know, countries do it. Churches do it. And families do it. Separate sheep and goats, us and them. Put two lists, two lists. But Jesus lets us know that's not the heart of God. The heart of God has joy and repentance. Not some, but for all. For all. For all who repent. And it's an invitation to repent. An invitation to come back into the relationship. To be restored. To be reconciled. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, But all things have been given to us by God. All things, not some things. All things have been given to us by God. Through Christ who reconciled us to himself. And he has given us a ministry of reconciliation. He's given you and me that same ministry of reconciliation to restore. This morning, it may be that in your family there's, there's brokenness. And that it might be the brokenness of a, an old, older brother, a younger brother, sister, aunt, uncle, mom or dad. Or it may be that the folks that don't behave like you, don't believe like you, don't belong in the group that you think you belong to. And you've gotten quite comfortable at making a list of us and them. There's still room in the heart of God for you and me. And it begins 
in repentance, to turn, to change, to come to our senses, is the way Jesus says it right here. And it's the invitation to joy. Because it's in the separating of the sheep and the goats, the us and the them, the, the insiders and the outsiders, there is no joy. There's only strife. This morning, I want to pray with you. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, your invitation is one to joy again and again and again and again. A joy of repentance. A joy of turning. A joy of dependence on you and not our own goodness. Not our own behavior, not our own beliefs, and not our own belonging, not our own group. Jesus, you call us to worship, to practice that word forgiveness each week. We practice it because it doesn't come easy for any of us. We like pointing to those with the worst record. And it keeps us having to look at ourselves. But that's not where you call any of us. You call us to a joy. A joy that leans on you. A joy that relies on you. That depends on you. That trusts that you are God and we are not. That trusts that, that well, this kingdom belongs to you. And that we get to be a part of it so we can respond in gratitude rather than trying to control and manage and police the rest of the world. Lord, this day, give us those ears that hear your voice and we respond in repentance. Give us those eyes that see your hand and that, that all things, your kingdom, it's, it's, it's available for us here now and that it's available to, for us to enter into it. Not by dividing and separating and controlling, but by following, following you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.